Well, when we think about our four campuses and our different missions and our different emphasis, the reality is that there's one aspect that brings all of us together, and that is students. Not only students, but our devotion for students. Um, this morning, I want to also celebrate the fact that in addition to having us having breakfast, we had student ambassadors from MSU Northern joining us, engaged in conversations, uh, allowing us to know what's going on uh, in campus. Yesterday, as I was moving from one building to a, for our breakout sessions, there was this group of students that uh, pulled me aside and invited me for a combined ride. And I insisted that I needed to be in this meeting, and they just looked at me like, there's nothing more important at this moment than <laughs> jumping on that um, combine, right? So the students are what? Uh, the reason that we do what we do. And that's why I'm so privileged to head this panel at this moment. And first of all, if we can just briefly introduce ourselves so that our audience know who's with us here. Starting right here with Randy. Good morning. I'm Randy Bachmeyer. I'm Dean of Extended University at MSU Northern. I've been here 13 years and seen a variety of different roles from online learning to student um, disability services, tutoring services, and most recently um, we've received a grant to assist our American Indian students um, better so that we can better serve our American Indian students, um, make them feel more welcome and provide the services that they need here. Thank you, Randy. Chris? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Chris Kearns. I'm Vice President uh, for Student Success at Montana State uh, Bozeman. Uh, I've been in that role for over a year now, hard to believe, because I still feel like uh, the new kid uh, on the block. <laughs> and it's a real privilege to uh, be able to work with uh, the colleagues on my campus and more recently through the work that we've been doing across all four campuses with some of you working on our uh, CRM system. And, and I get to work with Tracy in Leadership Montana. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, last night he showed that he's a great actor, too. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Camille Consalvo. I'm the Chief Student Affairs Officer at Great Falls College, MSU. Thank you, Camille. Good morning. Okay, I was, I was testing you to see if you're as <laughs> responsive as my students with 8 o'clock classes, and it's about the same, so you guys are going to have to pick it up just a little bit. My name is Wayne Boyson, and I'm a professor here at MSU Northern. Uh, I started teaching here in 1997, and uh, my heritage to this institution actually goes back to 1992. So over half of my life has been with this uh, institution, so it's very much so home for me. Uh, I teach in the automotive, diesel, and ag mechanics areas, and recently uh, I've relocated in 2013 to uh, Wolf Point, Montana, and I've been doing teaching via Polycom. I'm from Wolf Point, and I was the president when you applied. <laughs> yeah, very good. Negotiated the deal. And you're in Billings now. Right. Yeah, very good. Nice to see you. So since 2013, I've been in Wolf Point and teaching back to MSU Northern via Polycom with a hybrid teaching solution, interactive uh, video conferencing. So I've got a little bit of a, a variety as far as uh, teaching experience that hopefully we can talk about this morning and, and share uh, from the students perspectives what that's like as well so mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much so um, so what we will do next is that each of our panelists will have a presentation but then we really want to open it for questions and a dialogue with the audience and first of all let's start with uh, Chris and Chris tell us a little bit more about so where are the, the missing links How about that? <laughs> when I look around a room like this, all the colleagues we have, all the passion we've heard, all the, uh, the questions and answers that we're trying to address, I think that despite the, 
the economic uncertainties we face, uh, despite the endless uh, number of uh, unfunded mandates and uh, dear colleague letters, we have really uh, good reason uh, to hope for the future of our work. So uh, what is it that we're asking uh, when we talk uh, about a student experience of a seamless MSU? I think we're trying to suggest that we should simultaneously focus on two areas. First, we're interested in the student experience uh, in a way that indicates we should be student-centered. The student experience is the single fabric, I think, out of which one MSU is knit together. I said differently, you know, students are really our glue, as the president was saying. Second, we're saying that the uh, student experience, uh, in order to be uh, seamless, would emphasize certain institutional qualities that we need to pay attention to and that we need to emphasize. These are qualities of continuity, qualities of coherence, qualities of predictability. We're not saying that we won't have local differences or that we shouldn't have local differences. We're not saying that we shouldn't have powerful points of pride on each of our campuses. But we are saying that the differences that we have and that the points of pride that we celebrate need to contribute to a larger whole uh, out of which the student can sense a single purpose, that this is their university system. So when we talk about a student experience being seamless at, uh, at MSU, we're talking about a road that we're already on to becoming the professional community of educators that are needed by our students, needed by our state in order to access what our friends here at Northern call an education that works, an education that really works for them. So the missing links that would help us provide students with this kind of continuity, this kind of coherence, this kind of predictability, uh, is uh, one that I think we can begin to bring into view if we break that question down into three parts. The first is the missing links question of what do we already have? What do we already have in place? What have we already done uh, that contributes toward a seamless MSU experience? And it turns out, as we've been hearing over the last two days, that we've already done a lot of work. We have common course numbering, we have articulation agreements, we have collaborative software like the Banner system, and the new CRM software that we just signed a contract for this week thanks to a tremendous amount of collaboration across all four campuses, which is going to continue as we move forward. We have new structures and practices in place, like one MSU itself, the retreats, uh, the meetings of our four campus university council. And thanks to our hosts, we even have a one MSU logo and team jerseys, right? So we're, we're on our way. Missing links question number two. But what's in the way? Given how much we've done, what drives or frustrate our, the student experience from being seamless? What is it that gets in the way? So we've already heard about some of this too in our meetings over the last two days. We've heard about some of the obstacles and why they exist. We've heard about needless complexity, like 32 admissions processes. Maybe we only need 30. <laughs> 11 payroll processes. Maybe we can cut that in half. We've heard about the history of each institution having a campus-centric focus that emphasizes the pursuit of local goods, even when they come at the expense of a larger common purpose. We've heard about a lack of communication, a lack of coordinated messaging, sometimes even a lack of basic humility and simple courtesy. So though we've done a lot, we still have quite a ways to go. Missing links question number three, what do we need? What could we add, subtract, or change in order to move closer to providing our students with an experience of a seamless MSU? Although answering this question could easily take maybe an entire lifetime, I'd begin with one suggestion that sounds simple, but I think it's actually one of the hardest things for a community like ours to achieve. And maybe some of my uh, uh, new friends um, would agree with this from this campus. We need a common language. We need a common language that expresses our identity, our values, and our aspirations. One where we can make ourselves understood to each other. A common langu language can help us understand who we are, what we want to do, and why we want to do it. We need to agree, for instance, about which student experiences we want to be seamless. For example, do we want admissions experiences to be, a, to be seamless, a single application, transfer experiences, web communications, student information systems, standard financial aid processes, enrollment experiences, common registration processes, single transcripts, 
What about student resources? Do we want common training opportunities, say for financial literacy, to add to those that we already have around alcohol education? Uh, do we need a common scholarship process? Uh, do we need common uh, expectations on our campuses and standards about performance? In other words, what components of the student experience count toward the seamless culture that we want them to encounter? Answering those kinds of questions is one of our missing links. Another of our missing links is the question of a common strategy for achieving for campus success. I would think we need at least two elements for a common for campus strategy. First, how can we build optimal student cohorts to take advantage of each campus's strengths and their distinctive market? The assumption here is that we need to focus on differentiation and on collaboration rather than on unplanned duplication and sometimes destructive competition. The second element of a common four campus strategy would involve revising our definition of student success. From a focus on inputs exclusively to a focus on balancing inputs and outputs. Our high school graduates are currently dropping at the same time that competition for out-of-state students is increasing. Our most important growth area opportunity requires a collective strategy for getting the right student to the right campus in order to get them graduated. We don't just need to get them in. We need to get them through and we need to get them out. This goal begins with four elements. We need to optimize our pipelines. On our campus, in order to come up with 3,000 students, we have to start with over half a million leads. We have to go from half a million to 3,000. We can optimize that pipeline. We need to increase our applications. We need to improve our yields. We need to raise our retention and our graduation rates. In order to design a strategy to balance inputs and outputs, we have to understand at a four campus level, what are our outcomes targets? What are the risks to reaching those targets? We have many bright spots. Where are they? How can we leverage them? What's our current and our projected performance in the areas that we measure and we care about? All of these right now at the four campus level, even if we think we know them at the individual campus level, these are missing links. It seems there are a number of missing links, but I'd like to conclude by considering what I think might be the most important one of all. And to answer that question, I want to uh, turn to my recently discovered uh, passion for Shakespeare. <laughs> I'll borrow a page from our wonderful entertainers last night, um, whom I can never thank enough for introducing me to my own personal Romeo. <laughs> and I'll quote from Cassius, who in uh, Julius Caesar, who's talking to his friend Brutus, and he asks him to think about why a community of equal equals can't find a way to work together as equals each doing his or her own part in achieving a common goal, rather than waiting to be told by some supposedly superior authority, or even worse, feeling like they have to wait on guidance from somewhere else and feeling bad about that, why can't they do it for themselves? Cassius says they could blame the fact that they are fragmented, rather than unified, on their situation. They could blame it on their fates, or they could blame it on their stars. But, says Cassius, in one of the most famous quotes from uh, Shakespeare, and I won't do this in falsetto. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Each of us, in other words, is a link in that chain of common purpose that binds us together as one MSU. And for the sake of the common good which we offer our students, what, Man what Montana State Northern calls so beautifully the opportunity to be successful and happy, in order for that common purpose to be achieved, None of us can afford to be missing. Thank you. Uh -huh. That's. <laughs> Bring out the swords now. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was that was fantastic, and a lot to a lot to think about. Okay, so let's continue then talking about those missing links and how do we promote those connections. And, and let's start from the very basic um, topic about, so 
what do we need to do uh, in two-year to four-year transitions? And uh, we have an expert here in the audience in Camille Consolvo. So Camille, tell us a little bit more about those, those transfers and those transitions. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. We had to sort of script together because I didn't <laughs> want him talking about missing links that I, were, I was going to say weren't. So um, I think we're going to do okay here. Um, in, in trying to look at seamless transfer, sometimes we get students, like for example, from MSU Bozeman that transfer to a two year. So it's, it, it can work four year to two year or two year to four year, but I'm going to focus on the two to four year. And, and think about a couple of things related to seamless transfer, and that's setting expectations, um, talking a little bit about our one MSU MOU for transfer advising, defining transfer, and then talking a little bit about articulation agreements. So in terms of setting expectations, one of the most important things we can do on our end to help students transition from a two-year to a four-year is to set the expectation that the culture is going to be different not better or worse, just different. Um, we try to help students build self-advocacy skills. They often had a, have a hard time asking for help. We're a small campus. They're used to having people su that su challenge and support, um, but they're on a larger campus that's harder to find. So they, and if they're often gonna be moving, if they're moving from our campus to another campus, they may be moving from a professional advisor who's there you know, eight plus hours a day to a faculty advisor who may not be as easily accessible um, because they have multiple responsibilities. So helping students understand that difference is, is really key. One of the things that our students have noticed um, after transferring is the need to seek out assistance, as I said, because we are smaller, they sometimes feel lost on a larger campus, um, and we try to set the expectation that it will be different upon transfer and it's important to take advantage of those resources. Um, I don't think Diane Donnelly at MSU Bozeman will care if I use her phrase, but she said it's important for them to understand that they need to build a culture of self-initiated student services. And the services are out there, but they need to go find them because it's just a different kind of culture. Transfer orientations that help students connect and engage with other students and with campus resources is important. Not treating them like a, a first year student because they have classes under their, their belt. They don't always need to know some of the nuts and bolts about how to be a student, but they need to know nuts and bolts about how to be a student at that particular campus. Um, it's also important for advisors to refer students up front to the transfer campus contacts and for the transfer campus to reach out to transfer students and directing students not just to faculty, say they want to go into, I don't know, criminal justice here, but if they're, if they're, they get into that program and realize that's not what they want to do, but their only contact is with the criminal justice faculty, they may decide to drop out altogether rather than if they have a general contact that can help them see a bigger picture of other options, um, then that's important to do as well. One idea we got from um, MSU Bozeman about what the four-year campus can do before the student transfers is to reach out to the student sooner so they start to feel connected. Um, one of the academic advisors in engineering asked for a list of all of our one plus three students the first year they, they came into our program so she could reach out to them and introduce herself as their Bozeman advisor so they knew that they were a part of a program there as well as here and they had someone waiting for them to get there. And I think that's a great practice that we could implement more broadly. Some of you may know, some of you may not know, since 2013 we've had a one MSU transfer advising for a one full-time equivalent position across the four campuses to share to help with transfer advising. Um, those, it's really not one person, it's shared across four advisors, but um, they each liaison with a particular program or particular campus to help our st students transition to that campus. And we've started making regular campus visits, phone calls, making connections with those campuses 
faculty and staff, our students have made campus visits. And we've also been marketing the four campuses like start here, go there, um, to try and help that relationship building and make the process more seamless to and we need to continue to improve on how we do that. We value knowing that um, the contacts on the other campuses and the advisors here and the other campuses value knowing who we are so that they can facilitate things for students. Last spring, for example, three advisors from um, MSU Bozeman visited the college and found it very beneficial to have a context. They saw what our students experienced and who our students are and met with our faculty and staff and it really put things into context for them. Um, and these continued collaborations and visits between campuses can assist in that seamless transfer. I think the other thing that's important um, to do is define transfer. Our, a lot of, uh, especially not right out of high school, people that live in Great Falls are place bound. They don't want to move somewhere else and they think transfer in their mind means I have to move to Bozeman or Haver or Billings and we need to work with them to understand that transfer doesn't always mean leaving Great Falls. Um, that they can attend Great Falls College mm -hmm. and transfer to another four-year um, institution without leaving town. We have 41 articulation agreements with um, other institutions that allow students to stay there and get a four-year degree. Um, only about 22 percent of student or of people in Great Falls that are 25 and older have a baccalaureate degree or higher so there's a real untapped market there um, to help them get that four-year degree and, and it's important to try and make that as seamless as possible. As Mary Shihimo said yesterday, the, the common course numbering that's come up several times, um, in theory that would make transferring very seamless um, and it has helped a lot. Um, but there's also values to the articulation agreements or pathways um, so that students get in the right courses. It's not just taking a course, but taking the right course. Um, I think the laying out that sequence and selection of courses so students and advisors have that academic plan so they can be directed in the right way um, can help. And one of the articulation agreements like the one plus three engineering and and others, whether it's an articulation or pathway, one plus three or two plus two depends on how quickly students get into specialized coursework in that um, program. So laying out the coursework really enables students to take the courses they need and not waste time or resources, mm -hmm. as Greg has mentioned. They take the right courses when they, they need to and not have to retake courses. When we set up our articulation agreements, engineering articulation agreements with MSU Bozeman, the faculty at both institutions engaged in conversations to develop these. That's how they were developed. Most of the details were hammered out in one or two meetings with some email exchanges afterwards. One of the, an example is when we um, did the civil engineering articulation agreement, they want their students to take introduction to government as one of the general education courses because of the amount of work that civil engineers do for government agencies whereas the other engineering departments were fine with any social science or history course in a general education course so it's really working out those finer details that are important for the smooth transfers the engineering department at MSU was really receptive and open uh, based on what I understand in creating that transfer pathway because they really felt like that some of our students might make a better fit from a two-year college because they're they could be better prepared to succeed because they've already been students than some first-year students who may or may not know exactly where they want to head when they get to campus and when advisors and departments um, from the different institutions can get together and start a conversation then the little things that end up making a difference can be identified and students really benefit from those conversations. So the bottom line really, kind of to tag onto what Chris said, is it's creativity, communication, and collaboration 
So the three C's, creativity, communication, and collaboration across the campuses with the goal of student success can help create that more seamless experience for our students. Thank you, Camille. I think that one, one thread that we are seeing emerging from these conversations is that it takes a lot of time, right? That there is not a simple way for us to connect the dots in regards to student services and what our students need. And the other thing is how, how these campuses have placed special emphasis on those individual interactions with students. Um, I always admire students that are in this, um, uh, staff who are in these areas because they have to repeat the same information so many times, every day, week after week, month after month. So fatigue can ensue, but we need to stay vigilant because for that student who comes to us that first time, that's the only time perhaps that we will have an opportunity to have that interaction and to facilitate uh, that transfer or building on his or her strengths to promote more self-advocacy. So the third part is the importance of collaboration. And our next speaker will be uh, a great example of how, how an incredible program has facilitated uh, collaboration. And Wayne was sharing with me something um, at, uh, during breakfast time. So he has been with, um, with MSU Northern as a faculty member for almost 20 years. And then add to that the fact that he graduated from Northern. So when you add up all those years, more than half of his life, he has been associated with this campus. So those are some very deep, deep roots and that explained his, his passion for our students. So Wayne, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. I was asked to speak about uh, our diesel collaboration and, and really this goes back in time and to share with you in 1997 when I started as a faculty member here at uh, MSU Northern, we had a little over 100 students in our automotive and diesel programs. Our ag mechanics program was essentially defunct. There were, there were few students that were enrolled in the program at that time. And as we fast forward and, and look at where we're sitting right now, we're, we're currently pushing the envelope at 300 students within the automotive, diesel, and ag mechanics program. And we've been pushed and challenged by our chancellor to uh, look at a goal of 500 students within, within these programs. So we're taking this charge very seriously and we didn't get here by accident. And, and some of the things that have been directly responsible for those successes have been collaborative uh, events and it started quite honestly with articulation agreements and working with institutions in the state of Montana and outside of the state of Montana has been a real niche for us. Uh, Lindsay has, has been involved um, with recruiting on I-5 corridor in Washington and Oregon, working with a number of two-year institutions out there that we have active articulation agreements with. Uh, many of the challenges that, that Chris and Kamel were, were speaking of, we've observed that, we've done things wrong, we've done things right, and, and we're starting to see a trend and, and the boat starting to come up on plane with these articulation agreements. Now beyond the, the traditional articulation agreements, one of the new endeavors that, that we're starting to step out into is collaboration with, with other institutions. And that's, that's a big deal. It's, it's different than what an articulation agreement is because with articulation, as you know, we start with, with one or two years of, of uh, program, completed degrees at another institution, and everything transfers to MSU Northern and we take them from their third and into their fourth year. Collaboration is a little bit different because what we're looking at doing is working with other institutions during that time frame. So uh, up through and helping institutions. And, and an example of this is Fort Peck Community College. When I relocated to Wolf Point in 2013, at that time Fort Peck Community College on the eastern side of the state is very closely related and on the fringe of the, of the Bakken oil development. And what Fort Peck Community College is seeing at that time is, a, is an incredible need for students with, with diesel technology background because that's what, that's what keeps the world moving over there. They have to have technicians, they have to have uh, individuals within that program area. So the timing was right 
Fort Peck Community College approached us. They want to start a one-year certificate in diesel. Uh, I had an opportunity to move to Wolf Point. And so part of that collaboration, it revolves around technology. And this is, this is a piece of the puzzle that I'd, I'd like to, to plant the seed in, in some of your folks' heads to think about. Technology has changed over the years. The way we, we traditionally teach our courses has evolved. And when you go to the one end of the spectrum, we're looking at a traditional course where the instructor meets face to face with the students. And in our case, with, with the technical fields, we have a laboratory component. You can't just talk about the technology and not put, put hands on, on pieces of equipment to understand the processes. So there's the traditional format. And you go to the other end of the spectrum where we have strictly online courses. And with the online courses, uh, very seldom do you see face-to-face -face contact with instructor who are, instructors who are, are teaching within those disciplines. And it, it, they're, they're two different models, and they're successful models in their, own, in, in their own rights. The system that we're working on with the collaboration piece is, is a molded system, it's a blended system. We, we use the term hybrid system, and that's what I've been involved in in the last two and a half years. And we're using a system of interactive uh, video conferencing, and, and the system brand we're using is Polycom, but there's, there's other versions of this that are available. So to give you guys an idea on, on a day-to-day -day, uh, work as to how this blended system works, I show up at a scheduled time, and my face pops up on a television screen over in Brockman Center. There, there's a specialized classroom that's set up. So I show up on the TV, I see the students at Fort Peck Community College in Wolf Point. And so I can deliver my materials. Uh, everything that I've got on my computer shows up on a screen. It's interactive, and that's the neatest part about this whole thing. I can see uh, the reactions to the students as I'm, as I'm covering the different discipline areas. And, and we can go through, we meet at these normalized times. The hybrid portion of this, of course, is how do we do the labs? And so we've had a couple different models that have revolved around this, uh, from me traveling back to, to Haver to do specialized training on an all-day Friday, all-day Saturday to meet the needs of, of certain students, which has been uh, an interesting model. It's been more successful, quite honestly, than I thought it was going to be going into it. And that's, that's, that's an interesting piece. The other thing that we're doing is, as I deliver the lecture, I work with, with colleagues on campus. We collaborate through uh, specific curriculum. We've got rubrics that are associated with lab requirements. And we work with, with uh, dedicated staff on, on MSU Northern's campus to deliver the lab component. It's a pretty interesting interaction because when you think of it, the students are getting hit from multiple faculty members and, and uh, experience within the, the multiple uh, factory, faculty members' uh, backgrounds. Fort Peck Community College, uh, we're working on, on the collaboration, as I mentioned. It's, it's an expanding technology, and it gives us the ability to, to really collaborate with multiple institutions. So as I teach courses in, in Wolf Point at Fort Peck Community College's campus, Students can be in place in front of me live. We can have students at MSU Northern. We can have students enrolled at West Memphis uh, Community College in, 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 uh, in Arkansas as well. It really is unlimitless. And, and that's, a, that's a really unique piece of the puzzle as far as the collaborat collaborative event goes on. Students' reactions, um, to be honest with you, when we, when we started this project two and a half years ago, I didn't know what to expect. But the students have grabbed a hold of this, and, and the students actually kind of enjoy this. And, and one thing we have to keep in mind, too, is with, with the, the, the generation of students we deal with, they're used to this. They're used to interactive uh, learning. They're used to uh, you know, doing things on the computer. That, that's their world. And so they've embraced this, and, and it seems to be a successful piece. The, the thing to consider with this is it's not just our programs, and, and we can do this to a large event. Montana obviously has uh, some demographic issues with it. We're a large state. There's, there's uh, s several issues that the other panelists have brought up here as far as place-bound students and being able to deliver that sort of education. We can rethink our model a little bit and look at gathering an additional audience into these courses. Essentially, for this polycom system to work, you just need internet and a computer. And, and I've had students as far as away as Portland, Oregon, 
finishing up requirements for our, for our diesel program where a student was able to relate, relocate back and, and we were able to use this technology. It's very seamless, to be honest about it, and it's, it's been very successful. Um, we're looking at growing this. I know Chancellor Kegel, along with Lauren Schlofeld in the related training, are looking at, at trying to grow this program into uh, related training areas, the electrical and the plumbing areas. I think this is a, is a, is a very good technology and, and I can answer questions and share with you the ups and downs because it's, it's not all roses. There are some challenges associated with it, but I think I can give a unique perspective um, from, from a faculty standpoint as well as the interactions that I'm seeing with the students. So it's, uh, it, it's work. The last two and, two and a half years have, have been successful. So. Thank you, Wadid. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. I, I think that um, that is a wonderful example of, of how, as, as the panelists before have been saying, it's important for us to, to be creative, right? Um, when when the, yesterday, when I had my wonderful carriage ride in that, <laughs> In that 750,000 piece of machinery, um, se several things that allowed me to reflect. And this morning I was having a conversation with Greg Klaus, and Greg was saying, all of this you see in the diesel program, which is a jewel, uh, not only for Northern, but for the entire state, uh, it didn't happen out of nothing, right? Behind it, it was not only creativity, but there was deliberate action. Right? and a group of individuals that said, we, we can do better. Um, the story that you tell us today uh, provides us with evidence that it's possible to bring defunct programs back from the dead, but it requires, again, the um, uh, creativity, action, and as, as Chris was saying, we don't need to wait for an edict to come from the king or, or the queen, right? We, we can do that. If we move from being hamlets and always reflecting to be or not to be and move to action, right? And let's try new things. Uh, let's listen to what students have to say. Let's meet there where they are. And it's, it's an incredible example of, of a very thriving program. Thank you. So, Next is Randy Backmeyer, and Randy was telling us about this very interesting grant that, MS, that MSU Northern will receive or has received for a non-tribal institution that serves Native American students. And I will remind this audience that within the one MSU family, MSU Northern has the highest proportion of Native American students in the student population. About 13% of students at MSU Northern come from one of our tribes. So Randy, tell us more about this grant, please. Thank you. When I think about um, missing links, I think about it more from my background, which is working with um, at-risk students, tutoring, disability services, um, funny enough, distance students. Um, online learning tend to be at-risk students. Um, and obviously um, our American Indian students here. Again, we do have 13% of our student population is American Indian, so we're getting students coming here. Our problem is retaining them. Our retention rate fall to spring and fall to fall for American Indian students is about 25 percentage points lower than it is for um, our general student population. And it's very concerning, especially when you get that out to the six year mark um, because our graduation rate for American Indian students um, is anywhere from zero to 39 percent. It, and it wildly swings one year to the next. So it's very obvious to us that there are things that maybe we're doing that could be done differently or things we're not doing that we should be doing. <clears throat> so in looking at the research and talking to our students and uh, some of our faculty and staff, we came up with a model that we think would um, work very well and submitted it to the Department of Ed and we were lucky to get the, the 1.9 million five-year grant to, to do this. <clears throat> so 
one of the things we noticed right off the bat was we have sort of a deficit model. One of my favorite books is The Courage to Teach. And the author, one of the observations he makes is faculty often complain to him that um, they wish that they would quit sending him students who weren't ready to learn. Mm -hmm. And the comparison he made is, is, well, that would be like a doctor saying to quit sending me sick people. You know, that's what we're here for. We're here to teach. And when we think about these students, we, we start with that deficit model. And <clears throat> one of the first things that happens is in the first week, they'll get a referral to tutoring, right? So right off the bat, we're saying, um, you know, maybe there's something wrong with you. You should be going over here to, to you know, this other place and learn. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> So we're looking at these students, um, and we're looking at one little piece of the puzzle. Yes, they're coming to us with certain skills that may not be what we want. But, <clears throat> sorry. There's other pieces to this coin. So on the academic side of it, the other piece of that coin is, is faculty preparation. Are our faculty prepared to teach these students? And so we've worked into the grant a huge amount of faculty professional development. Um, and it can be, you know, I'm gonna call myself out a little bit. In teaching, one of my early teaching experiences was, um, I was getting a little bit frustrated because I had some students at the back who um, really weren't engaged and I didn't think they were paying attention. And they happened to be American Indian and they were all from the same tribe. I knew from talking from them outside of class, they were very bright, very capable students, um, and yet they just didn't seem to be engaged in class. And my frustration one day must have been obvious because after class, one of these students comes to me and she says, you know, the reason we don't talk in class is because we respect you. It's not because we're not interested or don't care about mm -hmm. what you're talking about. In our culture, when the elder speaks, you be quiet and you listen, right? And so that was really a humbling experience for me to understand that. Um, and frankly, it made me feel uh, quite bad for you know, the time that I had spent teaching not knowing those things. But those are the things when our faculty come here, they don't know those things. Uh, many of them come from out of state, um, maybe have never worked with this population before. And so we need to focus on faculty professional development at least as much, if not more, than the tutoring piece of this. Two other pieces of the puzzle we've identified that we need to work on are, um, we're calling it social engagement, and it includes both mentoring and um, social activity. So. Again, when we do this tutoring model, what we tend to do is say, there's this space over here, we, we wall it off and go over there because you need some help. And what we wanna do is build more of a community model so that these students, when they come, um, we're not immediately picking them out and saying, there's something wrong with you, go somewhere else. Um, we're saying, here's your community, right when you get here. And in this community, um, we're gonna have everything that you need built in right there. So, again, one of the things that has happened here at Northern, and it, it's a completely unintended consequence of a good intention, as, as many things are, um, we've had a multicultural center for here for years. And frankly, just about the only thing that multicultural center did was work with American Indian students. And so it kind of became the place for our Sweetgrass Society, our student club. And at a point, it became obvious that there were other populations um, that we needed to be paying more attention to as well. And so this multicultural center began to branch out and, and deal with all different populations of students. It's a great thing. However, the flip side of that was now all of a sudden, our Sweetgrass Society club 
members are telling us that, you know what, we feel like you took our room, <laughs> you took our place. And that is absolutely not um, the kind of model or message we wanna be sending those students, right? So part of this grant then too is, is we're going to um, construct a space that is um, a gathering space. And it will be um, one of the places that the Sweetgrass Society can come and do what um, their club functions are. But not just that, it's gonna be the place where we have a professional counselor, um, professional tutors, um, We'll be doing all kinds of activities there. We'll be doing our faculty professional development there. And so we're getting away from the idea of having um, uh, that deficit model. Somebody comes and we say, there's something wrong with you. Here's what you need. We're gonna, we're gonna put that thing here. Um, and saying, welcome to our community. This is our space. Let's work together and do what we need to do um, to get you through, get you graduated, and uh, whatever your future, your job, your goals happen to be. Thank you for that presentation, Randy. It's, it's evident that a lot of, of care and thought went into, into that grant. So congratulations. We, we look forward to, to learn more about the results as, as you evolve. Okay, so now we have a few minutes to open up this dialogue with our audience, and uh, I'm sure that there are many interesting conversations that we can uh, initiate. Any questions, comments? Yes, Florence. <laughs> Hello, um, my question is, um, actually I have a lot of them, but I'll ask this one. In terms of students who are acquiring a lot of debt, you know, I think it's really, really, it's a problem now, but I think it's going to be even worse. So are any of you looking at how to minimize student debt for students? Um, I know on our campus we do, for any student who has um, financial aid and a loan, when they come in, we meet with them and talk with them about what they need and what it's really going to cost and how much they're eligible for. Often students say, I don't want that much, I only want this much because that's what's going to cost me. So we've seen a change in that and we also have um, a half-time person doing financial literacy through all of our um, first beginning becoming a successful college student courses and they're having to do uh, learn about budgeting interesting fact one of our students wanted to know more about retirement planning than about <laughs> how to set up a budget because of what our students are who our students are but we are doing that financial literacy financial wellness I know they're doing that at Bozeman as well uh, yes, uh, we, we just uh, completed um, uh, a, a collaborative project with uh, some of our faculty members that resulted in a, a published paper, paper. It was picked up by the Fed. It was uh, uh, picked up by uh, Bloomberg, where what they looked at was we sent out, we targeted uh, students that we, uh, were, we thought were at risk of taking on too much debt. So we didn't send it to everyone. That's one crucial piece of the model. We targeted them with a Know Your Debt letter, uh, which was individualized to them. It turns out that targeting them was, uh, was really important because it meant that maybe their uh, roommate didn't get it, so it really was to them as opposed to you know, a spam uh, emailing. Um, and uh, what uh, our uh, faculty colleagues uh, found when they came and they looked at uh, the uh, data uh, of outcomes, were that three really interesting things happened uh, that are correlated. We can't claim that they're causal. One, students who got the Know Your Debt letter reduced their debt the following semester by about a third. Two, uh, it uh, increased their uh, retention rates. And three, it's associated with higher GPAs. 
So uh, this was uh, one of the first times that we were able to demonstrate an impact on microeconomic behavior just through an, uh, uh, a targeted outreach. We're very encouraged by that. We intend to tweak it and to, and to continue working with it. Yeah. Florence, I, if, I, if I may expand on, on that example. <clears throat> to me, it's been one of the most rewarding um, projects because the way it started, it was about three years ago when a conversation with Alan Yarnell. And I remember um, noticing two things. Number one, when students were going to financial aid with very good intentions, our staff were asking them, so how much money do you want? Instead of how much money do you need? So we needed to start with the staff and they were trying to help students, right? But inadvertently, we were getting them into more debt than what they really needed. The second thing was I asked Alan, so when do students know the, the, the balance that they have under debt? You know, before they, they're about to take more loans on a given semester, do they know what they already owe? And I was surprised when I learned that students don't know what their outstanding balance is. So that's when we started saying, well, what about if we sent a letter, which we call the Know Your Debt letter. It's a very simple thing. It's uh, actually, we introduced it, it to the regions last uh, September. And if you, some of you were in that meeting and what I did was I tweaked the, a, a letter and this one was addressed to a fictitious um, student by the name of Clay Christian. <laughs> so we <laughs> informed Clay what his outstanding um, loan uh, was. And, and then in that letter, we also tell the students about, well, here are some things you need to do. So first, we wanted to give them that jolt, like, you know, that you are $26,000 in debt. What are you going to do next? But we also wanted to offer some options like the Freshman 15 program, which every campus has, right? We have the flat spot where students only pay for the first 12 credits, but sometimes students don't know about that. So I think that the, the notion here is using some creativity. It doesn't have to be too complicated, but we can modify behavior and help our students. If, if I could just hop in real quick too from the faculty's perspective, Florence. One of the things that, that we strive very closely to for our students is academic advising because we're, we're part of that check and balance process and, and the, the flat tuition fee, the 12 to 18 credits being the same amount, we spend a great amount of time with the students in advising sessions individually asking them pointed questions, you know, what, what's your path? We need to make sure that you are getting you to graduation on time and, and that that's directly related to student debt as well. So we focus on that and we've got that message loud and clear as faculty. Could I just add one? Absolutely. Uh, I think what we're all talking about, uh, uh, if we want to back out a second, that's a, a specific example, uh, but uh, one of our opportunities as a four campus uh, system uh, or consortium uh, is uh, to design choice architecture uh, in ways, uh, our student choice architecture, in ways that can help nudge them toward uh, better decisions. Freshman 15, which the president uh, um, uh, just uh, talked a little bit about, that's, that, that's just giving students uh, a different environment in which to make choices. The know your debt letter, the timing of that, what the the, the information that says this is how much you you're actually you actually have in here resources to help. Another way to to provide choice architecture and advising with faculty members, with professional advisors or counselors. It's a chance for us to think about how we want to put together student choice architecture that doesn't require a lot of investment, but it does require the kind of creativity and collaboration that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. Chris, if some uh, people in the audience would like to have more information about the Know Your uh, Debt Letter. Um. Sure. H happy. Give me an email. Give me a call. Uh, if you don't have a lot of time, I'll send you some of those more than I do. <laughs> well, and, and actually, there's a four-minute video from Bloomberg News, and I just need to say, the first person that brought that to my attention about two weeks ago, it was Susan Wolf. So we were not even monitoring that, and Susan was the one to say, well, good job. So 
It's, it's fantastic. Unfortunately, time is up for this panel. I think that we have all learned a lot and uh, I think that all of you can see what I was saying about the incredible passion that each of these four individuals have for our students. We are in very, very good hands. So please let's give them a round of applause.